But what we've come to find out is that um, there was Satterfield at least a decade before there was Satterfield. And individuals uh, started reaching out about uh, their missing money. We've heard the story of how Alec Murdoch confessed to stealing millions meant for the sons of his late housekeeper. Now, other families who lost loved ones are coming forward. They tell eerily similar accounts of missing money after tragic deaths. Our Ann Emerson investigates why prosecutors say Murdoch was stealing from the dead. If a person will steal from, mislead, and deceive, People, when they've lost a loved one and they're grieving, I don't put anything past them. Attorney Justin Bamberg represents eight people who he says Alec Murdoch scammed out of their money. There's a lot of allegedly stole. It was There's no allegedly stole. Alec stole people's money. And like the landmark Gloria Satterfield case, Bamberg says some of that money was taken after tragedy. Case in point. Hakeem Pinckney, a deaf man severely injured in a car crash back in 2011. He was in a horrible accident, uh, rendered a quadriplegic, and he then died in a, in a nursing facility. And even after his death, Alex still stole money. Uh, how much? Well, that number is still growing. But Bamberg says Hakeem's family is owed well into six figures. And he says this case could implicate bank executives and other attorneys. Bamberg is handling another settlement, too. This time, a young woman named Blondell Gray. I believe it was $112,000 that literally should have gone to folks who lost their loved one. And instead, Alec took it and spend it on what he wanted to spend it on. Gray is one of the dozen money laundering and forgery state indictments that's keeping Murdoch behind bars right now, as is Sandra Taylor's case. She was killed by a drunk driver three years ago, and according to that indictment, Murdoch told her mother she would only receive a mere $30,000 as a settlement, when in reality, that figure was $180,000. Bamberg does not represent Sandra's mother, but as far as his clients go, he says he's going after those responsible. That includes Murdoch's law firm, PMPED, Palmetto State Bank, and anyone else who may get caught up in this net. If they will voluntarily do the right thing, there won't be a lawsuit. But if they won't, we'll file, at this point, nine multi-million dollar lawsuits and we will let 12 people in Hampton County show everybody what justice is. What's next for the reimagined schools? That's the $32 million question for this proposal. It took quite a beating at last week's CCSD board meeting. The concern from some opponents of the plan is who will end up controlling our schools? perhaps a sign of larger trust issues with district leadership. Our Ann Emerson finds out what needs to happen to get CCSD back on track. She has this ABC News 4 follow-up. I think that, I think that, um, I think that I had in my 11 years never experienced such a universal united reaction um, to something. Um, I think it took a lot of people by surprise. A surprise that derailed a $32 million plan to revamp more than 20 underperforming schools over 10 years. There just simply wasn't enough time to, for the community to, to absorb it or, or ask a lot of questions about it. Coates points out that the proposal was only introduced on December 13th, the brainchild of Coastal Community Foundation, the CCF. It was introduced to the board for the first time the week before Christmas vacation and was actually on the agenda for a vote to be adopted that night. Um, so I think things that kind of get pushed through that quick tend to make people leery. Leery and downright concerned. In the midst of this, the board replaced the superintendent, Dr. Postlewaite, with an interim, Don Kennedy. And then last Monday, there was a public outcry before this proposal was taken off the board's agenda altogether. We're told there's no immediate plan to put it back on. This poorly written and poorly documented proposal is not a valid community schools model. 
At the board meeting, Dr. Eric Mack conceded more public discussion was needed. The board felt very strongly that uh, because of that high concern that there needed to be more input uh, from the community. And it is imperative that a public district have the trust of the community as we move through some of these decisions, such as budgeting and hiring the superintendent and executing these ESSER federal relief funds for the COVID. Um, it's incredibly important, in my opinion, that the public have some level of trust. And um, I'm hoping that we can reestablish that quickly. Brittany Gurry has been a teacher for 11 years. We love it. Like we want to take care of these students. That's our job. It's our calling. In that time, she's taken on many roles. PE instructor, Berkeley County District Teacher of the Year, and now a new one. Teachers are covering so many duties. Um, we're staying after school for over an hour, not to do what our normal planning is, but to watch hundreds of bus kids who are they're waiting for a turnaround bus. The pandemic pushing all educators to step up and step in. It's our nurses. It's our principals. Our whole district is truly coming together to be team players. When there's not enough subs, we have to distribute kids. We have to take on those loads of extra kids in our classroom. Working tirelessly in their time off or scheduled breaks, contact tracing, watching classes, in some cases, even delivering lunch. When we have students eating in the classroom because we don't want all of our students in the cafeteria, somebody has to transport those, those lunches. And so we do have administrators if we don't have available staff. Are you working contact tracing today too? I, I am, I am. We've had some concerns come in. That's Jack Manser. He's the principal at River Oaks Middle School. He's been more than just contact tracing in his time off. He's also had to put some chalk on the chalkboard. You know, I've been in classrooms, um, teaching classes. Gurry says transparency and teamwork are key to getting through this. And hey, if you want to help, we need help. Go sign up to substitute. If you can just offer one day, that's one day that we have that will provide a normal day for our students. Adding it's been the toughest two years of her teaching career. In the end, she says this time will be a great symbol of resilience. If we can keep that grace going, that grace of understanding each other and that we are all in it for the best of our students, then it's going to be a beautiful partnership and we're going to get through this. Reporting, I'm Amy Rousseau.